hands and close your eyes. It's half past midnight, and you're listening to the Ghost Story Guys. Welcome to the Ghost Story Guys. I'm Brennan Storr. I'm Paul Bestel. And this is a show where we talk about spooks, specters, and all the other things watching us from the shadows beyond the campfire. Some conversations only make sense after the sun has set, and this is most definitely one. Thanks for tuning in. This is episode number 120, and we're coming to you from that tiny cabin you dream about but can never quite reach. How are you, Paul? I'm okay. We're surviving the petrol famine. Yeah, yeah. Things are normal and good over in England right now. Everything's great. Yes. We're not running out of food or petrol. Please ignore anything you may see or hear and carry on. (laughs) (laughs) This is normal. Boris wouldn't lie to us. We're all we're all good. <laughs> I notice you are you are recording in a different room than last time. Yeah, well, I didn't want to tempt fate. <laughs> that was that was weird. Last episode, it, listeners, if you haven't heard episode number one nineteen, uh, we had some weird stuff happen in the, our various studios and in our various lives, and uh, it made recording kind of an adventure. Yes, even the the cat hiding under the bed like a furry ninja. <laughs> um, was not responsible for the rest of the strange happenings. And then for the evening to finish with those four loud, enormous booms, just finished me off, I think. <laughs> yeah, talk, talk about putting a cherry on top of a very, very <laughs> weird Sunday. So, um, yeah, I'm in more relaxed surroundings on my uh, palatial settee, safe from any potential dark forces. Speaking of dark forces, I just got back from Revelstoke. <laughs> See how I set you up there. What a segue. Nicely done. Teed it up. Boom. And I, <laughs> I home run it. I don't know. Whatever you do with tees. I think that's a football reference. Anyways. So yeah. Just got back from Revelstoke. Surprisingly unweird. Uh, you know, mostly it was, it was pretty chill. There's a couple, you know, sort of unusual things, which I've shared with you off air that are not, you know, not interesting enough for, for the, um, for, for the show. They're not interesting enough for the show, but noteworthy all the same. Um, but then I did have two unexpected things happen. Mm-hmm. The first of which, which I shared with you, is I, I did one of these Ancestry.com DNA tests <laughs> because I've been, uh, Nikki, my wife, has been very, very engaged in sort of filling out my family tree because, as I mentioned, there's been some mystery in my the Italian side of my family. There's been some falsification of documents. And, and it turns out that, yeah, much like uh, a, a character in that Johnny Cash song, one of my relatives did indeed shoot a man just to watch him die <laughs> and then fled to the far, far reaches of Western Canada, Mm. which is very funny because people in that, in that branch of the family that we found, it's still very real to them. Even though it happened like 120 years ago, they still think that the mafia is just (laughs) waiting to find out where the children of, uh, you know, James Brutzi have gone so they can mow them down one by one. Cause this is not going to attract any kind of attention conducting (laughs) a a series of murders based on 120 year old blood feud in a different country. Mm. Well, you never know. Well, yeah, true. They are Italian. Grudges are held. Yeah, I've seen enough ne- Netflix documentaries to uh, to understand a little bit of their reticence there, perhaps. Fair. And here I am talking about it on a podcast. I'm smart. What's the worst that could happen? Now you've done it. <laughs> now you've done it. All right. Well, I'll, again, I'll make sure the, pass- the passwords are left out for you. <laughs> 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 but uh, yeah, so I, I you know, got my ancestry back and as expected, I'm very Italian. Uh, but what's interesting is my dad was adopted and he and I haven't spoken in 15, 16 years hmm. and, uh, we've never really been able to learn much about his side of the family. Well, <laughs> it turns out, yeah, I wasn't thinking about this, but the ancestry thing, some of my other family members from that shadow part of the family have done this. Hmm. And so now thankfully it doesn't notify them, but now I've got a listing of all these folks I'm related to. Yeah. And it's, it's weird, right? Because I'm looking at them and I, I sent you a picture of one of them. We don't look dissimilar. <laughs> it was a bit like looking at you with hair. <laughs> oh yeah. I remember those days. Mm, me too. But yeah, so it's, it's trippy because all these, there's all these people out there who I, again, I've, I've no connection to, mm. but uh, yeah, so that was very, very strange to find out there's all these doubles out there, but even stranger was my story from Revelstoke. Hmm. which began in a paranormal way. Yeah. So south of Revelstoke is an area called the Arrow Lakes. 
Mm. And if you've read my book, A Strange Little Place, available everywhere. Fine books are sold. Buy the audiobook, <laughs> please. You will know the Arrow Lakes region is very haunted. And there's it's a lot of strange energy there. Mm. Um, Sasquatch sightings, uh, lake monsters, lights on the lake, spirits, all kinds of weird encounters. Mm. Missing people. And so I don't go there very much anymore for reasons I, I've told you about and I don't talk about much on air. But yeah, it's a very powerful place. It's not a good place to be. If you're sensitive to this kind of shit, it can be overwhelming. But one day in Revelstoke, my friends, and my cousins rather, they wanted to go check it out. They wanted to go to Echo Lake, which is down mm. south. And so I thought, well, it's nice and it's a nice bright day. Sure, I'll give it a shot. And I started feeling kind of hooky as I was get, as going the right direction. But I thought, oh, it's fine. It's fine. It's, you know, I got a little bit of a headache building, but it's fine. It'll be fine. Hmm. And to get to Arrow Lakes, pardon me, to get to Echo Lake, you have to keep driving till the pavement ends, and then keep going down the, the, the gravel road, and then eventually take a left going up the, up the mountain, which is again all graded uh, dirt, around a number of bends, potholes, there's no cell service, it starts to get more remote, and all this time I'm thinking, Jesus, I can really feel now, everything feels kind of heavy. And it paid off, because, you know, it just felt like it was building to something, and, and it was. But not what I expected, hmm. because we took the turn off for Echo Lake, went down this long sloping hill through brush, and at the bottom it ends in a cul-de-sac, not a cul-de-sac, but like a turning circle. Hmm. And in the middle of the turning circle, there's a bunch of gra- like tall grass. And I was looking at, you know, at, the, at, the, the, at the outside of the circle, there's a couple cars parked, a couple kayaks were kind of leaned up against something, and you could see the lake itself in the distance. And then as we came around the circle through the grass, in the middle of the circle, I could see a picnic table. And a man sat upon that picnic table. And a head bobbing between his legs. (laughs) And I thought, no, that cannot be what I think it is. And then a blonde lady's head popped up because she was very surprised by the sound of the car. (laughs) And we had interrupted these lovely people in an act of... Mutual affection, shall we say. <laughs> and a long time ago, my friend and I and his wife, we were hanging out. I went to go see him over in the city he lives in. And he took me to this bar. It was a place they don't normally go. It was, he was just like, oh, you know what? I'm not going to run into anyone I know here. We can have a drink. We can have some food in peace. And sitting at this table were two people from his detachment who were married and not to each other. <laughs> and they looked like deers caught in the headlights and then they did that thing where you maintain eye contact because this is a normal day and this is a normal social outing you should come sit with us because we have nothing to hide <laughs> and just friends. these people yeah we're just good friends and these people on that picnic table him sat atop it and her kneeling oddly they fixed us with the same this is normal we're not going to break eye contact if you don't break eye contact stare <sighs> as we drove around the turning circle <laughs> and then just thought well we're not going to the lake today and back up the hill <laughs> and out of their lives <laughs> so good well I've seen the world according to Gap, so that situation could have ended a lot worse that's it we did okay, all things considered. I'm sure we've ruined, well, his day in particular, but hers day, her day too. <laughs> <laughs> and I guarantee you that is the last time he has that much fun on a picnic table. <laughs> so, yeah, that was the most exciting thing that, that happened in Revelstone. Brilliant. <laughs> Fabulous. Uh, however, on this episode, we have many more, uh, not... Not exciting that way, but we have some really exciting listener stories for you is because it is October. Me? What show am I in? <laughs> well, that's my other show, actually. That's, uh... <laughs> Naughty Nights with Brennan. <laughs> oh, you're not supposed to tell anyone. <laughs> it's my patron show. <laughs> hmm, I'm think- no, 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 no. Anyway, Supernatural on. Smut. I like that. Naughty Nights with Brennan's store. Supernatural <laughs> Smut. <laughs> Me and Chuck Tingle are going to partner up here. <laughs> But yes, it is, uh, it is October, of course, yes. and October is the month of Halloween, and traditionally October has been Listener Story Month, and so this month, we're, that's what we got, we got two episodes for you in October, both of which are going to be chock-a-block with wonderful listener stories, 
And if you want to get yours in, of course, there's still time to get some in before Halloween. We, we have a ton, but you know, we always, we always want more. And you can send those to ghoststoryguys at gmail.com. And we will, again, we'll get to as many as possible. But this month, this episode, we have a, a fantastic selection of stuff. But before we get there, we have two things. Of course, we have to thank our patrons, but we also have a musical guest. Because in past, October has not only been Listener Story Month, it has been Vampire Stepdad Month. And this year, I am so pleased to announce that Vampire Stepdad, his brand new album, Sanguine, has just come out as of October 1st. It is so good. It's, it's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's Vampire Stepdad. It, they're never bad. No. But uh, it is a great fucking album. You can find it at VampireStepdad.com. And the track we're going to be playing on this episode is called Montrose. It's the first single from the album. And again, huge fans of Vampire Stepdad. We're, he's got a Patreon. We're supporters of that. Enormously talented dude and a really nice guy as well. So you can find more from him at VampireStepdad.com, everywhere you stream your music. And make sure to pick up a copy of Sanguine as, as soon as you can because it's, uh, again, it's just a great goddamn record. And he is an artist worth supporting. But now it's time to thank our patrons. This one's for the patrons. Patrons, you are the Colonel Rhodes to our Iron Man or the Iron Man to our Colonel Rhodes. Again, whichever one you want. I'm pretty flexible. They're both pretty cool. And uh, this is where we, you know, you, you really, if you didn't get that we're comic book nerds, <laughs> this will help. This will help drive that home. But anyways, we could not do this without you. We appreciate the absolute hell out of you guys. And we'd like to take a moment to, well, we'd like to thank all our patrons, of course, but we'd especially like to take a moment to thank our latest patrons. They are Ethan Mays, C, KD, Heather Iron, Cheryl Baker, Jackie Krantz, Stacy Joe Scott, and Lisa G. Wyo Psycho. Guys, again, thank you so, so much from the bottom of our terrible, terrible hearts. The show just doesn't exist without you, and we appreciate the absolute hell out of you. If you want to find out how to join the team, head over to patreon.com slash ghost story guys, or listen to at the end of the show and we'll tell you about all the cool shit you get. Though we will tell you if you don't like ads and who does, for a dollar a month you get an ad free feed. Alright, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back with our first installment of October's Listener Stories. Welcome back. As we said before the break on this episode, in fact, all this month, we're going to be doing a series of listener stories and we're going to open with a listener story as well. It's, it's a little bit shorter. And so we didn't put it into the main body of the show, but it, we really wanted to share it uh, because it's also, it's also quite sweet. So this comes from Brooks. Brooks says, a family friend of mine who used to work with my grandpa died May 3rd of this year. He died fairly young due to organ failure. It took him pretty quickly. Him and I were very close. I called him my uncle because he was always around even during the worst times of my life. He was one who taught me how to drive and how to build a fire. We would go to the local college team sporting events a lot, especially football. Same thing with minor league hockey teams. About a week ago, I had a dream where he and I were leaving my grandpa's house. We were driving to some sports bar to meet my family for dinner. As we were driving, I knew what was going on enough that I just leaned over and put my head on his shoulder. And he said, yeah, buddy. He always called me buddy from the first time I met him when I was five. Yeah, buddy. I know. I'm so sorry. I miss you. Shortly after that, I woke up crying, emotionally and mentally drained. So thank you for sharing that, Brooks. And, and I know Brooks is, uh, is a regular writer to the show, and, and we will always really, really appreciate that. And I know, you know they've been going through stuff, but uh, we just wanted to share that because it really is quite lovely. And uh, I know, we, you know we've talked before about visitation dreams and things like that and how, you know, just how they can be a nice, I guess, a nice relief from grief. I mean, the only thing that can really kind of cure grief is time. I mean, and you don't even really cure it. I think you just kind of grow around it. But hmm. it, at the same time, those dreams can, uh, can help things out. Yeah. And I think especially in the current climate for everybody around the world, there's a lot of people that have not had a chance to say goodbye. And I think 
a lot of people can take a lot of comfort in things like that and um it certainly helps people come to terms with their grief because like you say you don't i don't think you ever forget it or get used to it you just learn to get around it yeah that's it i mean my grandfather and i've talked about this before you know he and i were very close you know sort of in the absence of my own father's relationship he was kind of like my dad he died well 16 years ago hmm. and I still periodically pick up the phone to call him. Hmm. I, something will happen and I'll think, oh, I should tell him, I should tell grandpa about this. And it's, it's just the weirdest stray thought because he's been gone so fucking long, but you still have that, that weird moment where you're like, oh, I should tell this person. And then it kind of hits and you go, oh shit. And it doesn't hit as hard as it used to. You know, I'm not, I'm not sort of like crying or anything, but, but still you, it just, it, you feel that sting. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of crazy how grief will sneak up on you like that. Grief's a real bastard, Paul, is yes. what I'm saying here. Yes, it is. I completely agree. It's very similar because my grandfather's been dead 22 years. And uh, it is strange that it's it's so far away. And yet sometimes, depending how it catches you, it can feel far, far more recent than that. It's a weird thing. Yeah. I, I know when I would stay in Revelstoke uh, at my aunt's house, you know, she a lot of her furniture is from my grandparents' house after they passed. Mm. And periodically you would open a dresser or a drawer and you'd catch a very strong smell of perfume or aftershave. Yeah. And it's incredible how, how smells will just hit you like a ton of goddamn bricks. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's the most unappreciated of the senses, I think. Especially when it comes to paranormal events as well. I think we've all got experiences in our life where we've, we've been doing something completely unconnected and then you get hit by a scent. And it, oh, yeah. boom, like that. It takes you to somewhere you probably never thought of for years. It's such a strange thing. Weirdly, uh, around the same time you and I were having all that weird ass problems with uh, recording episode 119, <laughs> yeah. Nikki and I were kind of having odd electrical problems in the, in the apartment. And um, I mean, to the fact that we came back from our trip and our kitchen lights weren't working, the dishwasher isn't working. Um, Two of the lights in the bathroom, which we just replaced, were burned out. Uh, and prior to us leaving, we would smell this floral perfume. But it's not, it's in the apartment. It's not coming from outside because there's no one in the lobby. The window isn't open. It's just mm. here and then it's gone. But it's, it's noticeable enough you can't help but, but catch it. But we can't either pinpoint where it's coming from or exactly what it smells like. It's just this sweet floral smell that's yeah. here and then gone. I think it's out of all the paranormal experiences, I think smell and scent and aroma is probably one of the most unappreciated and, and under investigated. I agree completely. Uh, briefly on the subject of investigation or lack thereof, perhaps I was contacted by a listener who was listening to another podcast. And this is not one of our group of friends. This is a podcast that is, uh, you know, is part of a major network. And they said, oh, there was a story on there that sounded so much like your bat story. You know, <laughs> where my, of course, if you've been listening for a long time, you'll know that when I was a kid, I saw s s shadow bats. I'm not going to get into it. It's, it's kind of in the archives, but they said, yeah, it's just like the shadow story, except it has a little more. You know, it's more about how the shadows affected the person's mental health and, and that he lived with them. In the, and they said, oh, I just thought you'd want to know that it was so interesting that someone else out there has had that experience. And I thought it was interesting and I appreciated the listener sending it in. Uh, however, it was interesting because I had a meeting on the phone with a producer from that show in May of 2019 in which I told them that story and they said, oh, is there any way we can make that more about the mental health part of that? You know, and how like it affected your mood. I said, well, I mean, a little bit, but I mean, the story is a story. And they said, cause I was auditioning to be a storyteller on their show. And this woman said, I'll, I'll take this to my producer and we'll be in touch. And of course I never heard anything back. And lo and behold on this miraculous coincidental story, which is just slightly more narratively satisfying the way they wanted it to be has manifested for them with someone who's a really skilled teller of these stories. And it's almost like they rip stories off from people, put them into script form to make them more, again, more narratively satisfying and have actors read them, pretending to be the people who are actually experiencing it. Can you imagine such a thing, Paul? I wondered where that money had come from in my account. <laughs> you beautiful bastard. <laughs> so, yeah, so that was kind of funny because, again, I just, uh, 
I took that call and I didn't think about it again. And then sure enough, you know, the show, which is again, a major show it's, it's behind a paywall. So I, I haven't listened to the episode because I refuse to pay for it. But, uh, yeah, it sounds like they took my story, rewrote it to make it, uh, you know, to make it more of a, like more of a proper flowing story, had an actor read it and you know, I'm not mad about it. It's, but it's a valuable lesson to anyone coming up because nowadays I would not give away shit like that for free. I'm just, I'm way more savvy about the industry, but I was just naive and I was thinking, oh yeah, you know, I might get to go on the show. That'd be great press for ghost story guys and not, okay, I'm going to get fucked out of my story by these ghouls. <laughs> so yes, I'm not naming the show cause I'm not sure if they can sue me. Mind you, I've got the email from their producer asking, you know, sort of setting up the phone call. But anyway, anyways, point being, <laughs> yeah. If you're out there listening to this particular paywalled podcast, which is, I, I cannot stress, is not put together by anyone in our circle, anyone in our cohort, none of our friends. They are, this is a, this is a, a major network show that purports to be true ghost stories and uh, uh, maybe a little more true bullshit than anything. <laughs> All right. Speaking of stories, it's about that time. This story comes from Lauren. When I was 12 years old, I moved with my family from the west coast of Canada to Toronto into an old red brick house near the center of the city. My father traveled a lot for work, and when he was away, I would often sleep with my mom. One night, as I was snuggled next to her, I woke up, and as I opened my eyes, I saw a lady standing next to me at the side of the bed. She appeared to be in grayscale, her hair in a bun, wearing a high neck top with a brooch and a long skirt. The only thing I recall about her face was when I looked at it, she appeared quite angry, glaring at me. I was shocked, and remember thinking to myself, you're just dreaming. Close your eyes. It'll be fine. I closed my eyes and after a minute or so reopened them, thinking that I would wake up and the gray lady would be gone. But there she was still staring at me. As I looked at her again, my gaze went down to her skirt and I was stunned to see that she appeared to be hovering above the ground. I couldn't see her legs or her shoes. At this point, I was so scared. I recall my internal dialogue stating an emphatic, nope, and I rolled over to snuggle into my mom's back willing the angry lady to go away, and eventually fell back asleep. That was the only time I saw her, but I do remember that there was a playroom in the basement, which my brother and I never liked to play in for long, as it felt like someone was watching us, and always had a strong smell of floral perfume that no one in the family could ever find the source of. Talking to my mom as an adult about the house, she said she always had a bad feeling in the basement, especially in the laundry room, where she felt like someone was watching her too. I've been trying to do some research to see if I can find information on previous owners of the house and got a lead on who the Grey Woman may be. No such luck as of yet, but the search continues. And I, I guess at this point I shouldn't be surprised that the very first story we have, I mean, I put the thing together, but I you know, completely forgot about the floral perfume thing. But our very first, you know, connection beneath the skin this time is floral perfume. Mm -hmm. I got to say, though, there is nothing quite so dispiriting as doing the old, okay, close my eyes, it'll be gone, and then they're still there. Hmm. That's, that, is, that is ghost dick move. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely a ghost going, nope, I'm not a figment of your imagination. I am right here. Yep, I am going to scar you for life. Get used to it. Here I am. <laughs> and also, I'm just trying to demonstrate that the floorboards have changed. That's a great point. I hadn't thought about that, but that could be it. The level of the floor having changed. Absolutely. And I think that's often the case when it when apparitions are said to be floating. Things have changed so much over the years. Oh, shit, right, because there's that Roman Legion story you told me. Yeah, fabulous. Right, 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 right. Interesting. Well, I'd be curious, Lauren, to know if you dig up any more information on the woman who lived in the house. I mean, I, I usually, I'm hesitant to say these things are always kind of connected to the history of a location, but, I mean, if you find information that is strongly suggestive of that, then... You know, obviously that seems to be a thing that happens too. Mm. I'm curious to know why she was angry though. That's unusual. Might be, why are you in my house? I know uh, there was a story I heard from a cafe once where 
they had a real, real problem with the place. And it turned out allegedly to be a, the spirit of a woman who used to cook for a lot of people. I don't know if it was her family or what, but she was pissed that she was not the one providing for people. Um. And that's why she was causing such a ruckus around the place because she was annoyed that she was not the one able to cook and, and yeah, provide for, for everyone. This story is from Michelle. I have believed in ghosts from an early age. And while I never invited an encounter, I look back on my childhood now and realize I had encounters. And because I was told ghosts weren't real, I simply did not know what those events really were. But my most unquestionable encounter came when my family and I, there were nine of us, me and my three kids, my brother, sister, and brother-in-law and my parents, traveled to West Virginia five years ago. Five years ago this month, actually, for a family reunion, and we found a house to rent for a few days. It was a great house, older, but updated. It had a beautiful staircase made of local timber from the property, and handmade cabinets in the kitchen. All through our four-day visit, though, strange things happened, but it wasn't until we started comparing occurrences that we realised it was a fully haunted house. I emailed the owner after we got home, and told us some of the things we had experienced, and she totally agreed that it was haunted. Well, thanks for putting that on the renter's notes. A few of the things we experienced were a foul smell one night in the front foyer. It smelled like something dead. It was awful. We thought maybe something had died under the house, but it was gone in just a few minutes. Also, the thermostat in the downstairs hallway kept changing to much cooler than what it was set on. My brother would be freezing cold every morning when he woke up. We would hear glasses clinking in the kitchen, someone walking on the creaky stairs and down the hallway, noises in the downstairs bathroom, and my sister's dog would not go down the downstairs hallway. Individually, we experienced lights flickering, sounds of glass breaking, children talking and laughing, a dog barking in the house, and afterwards, in looking at the photographs I took, we saw the reflection of a man and a woman in the glass door. There was a basement at the house that just gave me a dreadful feeling and I wouldn't let my kids play down there by themselves. When we would come downstairs in the morning, there would always be a couple of glasses sitting on the kitchen counter. Every one of us thought everyone else was up during the night, walking downstairs and getting a drink. But it turned out that none of us had. When I emailed and asked the owner about the history of the house, she said it had belonged to her grandparents and her grandmother had died of leukaemia in the front bedroom what is now the foyer, back in the 1960s. Her grandfather had had a bad heart and always kept the house cooler than most people thought normal. He passed away in the bedroom in the downstairs hallway where the thermostat was constantly moved down and where the dog refused to go. She said her father and grandfather together had made the kitchen cabinets and installed them. She said the house had been rebuilt in 1946 after a fire and her grandparents raised four children and ran a dairy farm there. She inherited the farm from her father, and she lived there for two years. She experienced the glasses left on the kitchen counter, and the sounds on the stairs in the hallway. She saw lights go on and off, out in the old dairy barn, and the doors to the barn open and close by themselves. She also said she was always uncomfortable about being in the basement, and would never go down there. So many things that she and I compared notes on were amazingly similar. I don't know if the children's voices, glass breaking and the dog barking were residual from when the house burnt down in 1946. But my parents said the noises kept them awake, which is quite a feat when my father can barely hear, and someone turned off their nightlight every night. It didn't dawn on us that anything was paranormal until, like I said, my family and I started talking about the things that had happened to us individually and collectively. We still talk about that place. It was a pretty amazing trip, with hosts we hadn't planned on having, but my 70-something parents became believers in ghosts after that. Now that's my kind of break. A nice vacation in a haunted house. I don't know, like a Bestel getaway, a Bestel six, I don't know, I got a, something like that. The best I got Bestel this weekend. <laughs> they ended up staying in a haunted house. <laughs> yeah, that phrasing, phrasing might have ramifications beyond your intentions. Well, as long as I stay out of graveyards, I should be fine. <laughs> <laughs> at 
Listeners, yeah. I don't know if you'll get that one. Maybe it's better you don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that sounds that sounds like a lot of fun actually. Because it, whilst it's creepy, I don't think it's scary, is it? And I think after a first couple of nights, you'd be like, "Oh my god, this is amazing." Yeah, it sounds pretty great, and I kind of love. You know, it's obviously sad that the, the, you know, that the grandfather passed in that room, but I love that he's come back from beyond the grave to do the very dad thing of turning the thermostat down. <laughs> yes, we'll have none of that going on here. <laughs> that's right. I'm not made of spectral money. Put another jumper on. <laughs> that's right. I Run remember. about a bit. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Just do some calisthenics. Spooky <laughs> calisthenics. Yes. I remember years ago when I was living in my house uh, back home and it, you know, we'd been out in the rain and... Uh, a friend and I and came home and my friend was still living with his folks and I came home and yeah, it was, it was, my shoes were wet. So well, turn it on the furnace because I'm putting my shoes in front of the radiator. And my friend said, Jesus, I, what is it like to just be able to do that? If I go anywhere near the thermostat, my father will literally appear out of the nearest potted plant and swat my hand away. And it, 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 yeah, so I'm familiar with that trope from television and my friends, but obviously never had any interaction with it myself. But no, the furnace just goes on. I turned the, I mean. I paid for the fucking oil in there. I'm going to turn the furnace on. <laughs> but now grandpa, grandpa is having none of it. And I kind of love that. I like the dog thing as well, because there's the dog barking, but there was a dog with them. I mean, I'd like to know if the dog was reacting to the other dog or vice versa. Oh yeah. It never even occurred to me if it's, cause if it's a time thing, you know, if it's like one of those kind of breakdowns in the way time works, it could be that the, you know, again, 50 years ago, their dog is going ape shit for no apparent reason. Because it's seeing this dog, you know, is 50 years hence. <laughs> or even they could be able to smell each other. Maybe that was it. Once again, yeah. we're going back to aromas again. The other thing that caught me about this, Michelle, is you mentioned that your father, you know, the, the, the sounds kept him awake, despite the fact he's very, that he's hard of hearing. And it reminded me of a patron interview I did with James Salcedo of Salcedo Paranormal. James is legally blind, but he had an experience. Uh, and James, I may be misremembering this. I know you listen, so you can tell me, but... We, he was saying that even though he's legally blind, when he had a spectral encounter, he saw the thing perfectly. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like these experiences supersede our senses in some way, which is, is strange because obviously they're visible or they're, they're audible because someone else saw this person as well in James's experience, as I recall. And obviously with, with Michelle's family, someone, they, you know, other people heard the sounds. It wasn't just her father, but it's almost like the, the perceptibility of these things somehow yeah, it transcends our actual physical senses, and I can't even begin to get my head around that. This one comes from Charlene. I was listening to the Gnome episode and freaked out when you started discussing apparitions wearing red flannel check shirts. I didn't realize it was a thing, but now that I know it is, I'll share my story and a few other things with you. In 2014, I went on a holiday to Sweden with my husband and children. Instead of staying at a hotel, we rented a house. The owners were going on holiday to the Canary Islands whilst we used their home. As soon as we arrived, the owner, who still hadn't left yet, showed us around. Right by the front door was another door, leading down to the basement. I had a weird feeling that I didn't want to go down there, so I let my husband go instead, and he told me that it was where some of the cleaning supplies and washing machine were kept. Throughout our stay, I tried to avoid that area because it felt creepy. One afternoon, I was out in the garden and saw the light was on in the basement. The back garden was very low down compared to the front of the house, so you could see the basement windows. My husband was confused, as he said he hadn't been in, so wasn't sure why the light was on. A few days later, the rest of the family had gone out to the park, and I stayed behind to clean up the kitchen. I couldn't find a mop anywhere, and wasn't happy when I realized that I would have to go to the basement to look for it. As I was going down the stairs, I saw a white-haired gentleman with a short beard, wearing a red-checked shirt and beige trousers. He seemed surprised to see me, and I looked away, pretending I couldn't see him. I grabbed what I needed and left as quickly as I could. I didn't feel that he was malevolent or anything. He just seemed like a nice old guy. I always wondered whether he was a relative of the people who lived there, but now that I know about the flannel men, I'm not so sure. I've also had some premonitions. Most of them were about small things, but two of them stand out in my mind. My mom has a thing about drinking, quote-unquote, raw tap water. She believes it has to be boiled, so she uses a thick glass jug for cooling down boiled water. Once I was filling the jug with boiled water, as my mom and I always did, when I had a vision of it exploding. I just saw it as if I was imagining it in my mind. So as I filled it, I moved my body to the side as far as I could from the jug. 
Within seconds, it exploded, sending glass and boiling water everywhere. If I hadn't seen what I'd seen and moved, I would have been scalded. The most amazing premonition I had was in 2003. I had a terrifying dream set in the grounds of Texas University. I have never been to Texas before, but had seen the campus of that university in a film many years before. In the dream, people were screaming and running in terror, and I felt fear the likes of which I've never experienced before. Whilst running, I looked behind me and saw a little white aircraft with a red and black line running down the side. There was something wrong with the left wing and it was smoking and about to crash. It didn't look quite like a plane, it was chunkier and shorter. I awoke with a start and that morning told my brother and husband about it, as it was bothering me so much. Later that same day, we were watching the news, and we learned that a space shuttle named Columbia had just crashed in Texas. There was something wrong with the left wing. I was open-mouthed when I saw the pictures of the spacecraft. It was the same one I had seen in my dream. It wasn't a plane after all. I guess I saw the university in my dream because I had no other frame of reference for Texas. Here's one more ghost story. When I was about 22, I got a job working at a jewelry shop in Dunfermline, Scotland, during the holidays whilst I was at university. The shop floor was at street level, and if you went downstairs into the basement, you had to walk down a corridor to get to the storeroom at the end. Before you reached the storeroom, you passed the staff toilets and the staff room. One day I went downstairs to get a watch for a customer. Just before I entered the storeroom, I saw someone wearing a long black skirt with black shoes walk across the storeroom entrance. I started chatting away, thinking it was Catherine, another lady I worked with who wore a long black skirt. As I was talking, I looked around the room and saw there was no one in there. There were no other exits. Confused, I told my colleagues what I saw. They said I had seen Wanda, so named because she wanders around. I don't know if it's true, but they said people had been bricked up in that building during the plague and left to die. Several weeks later, I came in from a lunch break to see everyone making a fuss of the window cleaner who was sitting down looking flustered. When I asked what was wrong, he told me that he had been downstairs getting a bucket of water. When he came out of the toilet, a girl in black walked right into him and disappeared. And Charlene, thank you so much. There is so much there. Um, so much cool stuff there. I mean, our friends, the plaid people have returned. Hmm. Or wits, as they're called in Sweden. That's what, I, I think that's what they're called. The little people in Sweden, they're known as wits, whites. Okay, really? Hmm. When I was listening to that, I was thinking, that really does remind me of something. And basically, in Scandinavia, they have trolls, but they also have wits or whites, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And they're basically okay. like small versions of people. Interesting. Well, I just recorded an episode of the Mission Spooky podcast, and we're going to be talking about uh, Tommyknockers and, and mind ghosts and things. And of course, one of the things that you know, I found in my research was that uh, stories of little people in mines go back at least as far as the uh, 16th century. There was a mention in, uh, I think it's Georges Agricola. He was a, a metallurgist and I think he's considered sort of the father of modern geology. But he wrote in, uh, was it the Anamantibus? I can't remember what it was, but some book about mining, he mentioned specifically these little guys about two feet tall. And he said they were, they would, um, basically they would kind of pretend to do stuff the miners were doing. <laughs> they would have little minor outfits, you know, I think he described it as like a leather apron and kind of a, a filleted jacket, whatever that means. And then they would, you know, fill a bucket with ore or they would move ore around and sometimes throw stones at the miners and supposedly <laughs> never hurting them unless the miners cursed them or, or hurt them. Mm. And I didn't realize that stories of, of that kind of thing in mines went back as far as they did. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Especially Cornwall as well. They've got it's probably here in the UK. That's probably the longest tradition of those little, little people helping out or causing trouble. <laughs> yeah. That was another thing. I didn't realize that mining in Cornwall had gone back thousands of years. I, I had no idea that the history was that deep. Yeah, yeah. Tin mines, especially. Yeah. Well, and, well, another thing, and I swear to God, I, Kiki's probably listening to this and going, you motherfucker, don't ruin that episode. It doesn't come out till the end of the month. <laughs> uh, but, uh, <laughs> and I promise I won't. But um, yeah, I, there was so much about that I didn't realize. Like the, 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 uh, the Cornish, the Cornish thought the miner thought that these things were actually the Jews who crucified Christ. Hmm reduced in size and sentenced to work forever in the mines for their, for their transgression. I, I had no idea 
that was even a thing. Is so yeah. much there, uh, and again, I'm sure there's even more that's not recorded, or at least not recorded in the places I was looking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's so many different traditions, all especially all over Europe, of of little people from Germany to Italy to Spain to Scandinavia. They've all got their own versions of it, and it's very interesting. But the Swedish ones I do like because they're very much like we have here in the UK with hobbits and bogarts and things like that, where they're kind of clusters like hanging around your house and stuff. And in right. Sweden. One of the traditions is if you ever poured hot water or boiling water or oil down your sink, you always had to give a warning of beware in case one of the little people was hanging about in your drain. Interesting. <laughs> that reminds me of the, um, the Muslim belief in the jinn mm. and saying bismillah before you like go to the bathroom, mm. basically saying like, excuse me, the belief being the jinn like to hang out in some of the, are certain kinds of jinn at least like to hang out in dirty places. Mm. So that's interesting. Again, all these little things across cultural lines. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they were the same as well. It was interesting that she mentioned that it was wearing red and sort of gray because that's the, one of the most traditional colors they are seen in, wearing red shirts and gray or brown trousers. Well, it was the uh, the red checked shirt. He, I think he had gray hair mm. and a red checked shirt. So it's, it's sort of like... Um, yeah, again, it, that sort of crosses over with this whole like uh, flannel man phenomenon. And I mm -hmm. wonder, you know, again, just the origin of that seems to be much more uh, folklore based than, mm -hmm. you know, we'd sort of been kind of considered to this point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more to this than meets the eye, I think. Yes. I know that was a Transformers reference and I refuse to dignify that with a response. <laughs> The other thing I thought was really interesting was her experience with the, the, uh, the, the premonitions. Mm. One, because, you know, you and I had talked about exploding glasses on a previous show. And, um, the other thing is that caught me about that is you know, her mom doesn't believe in drinking raw tap water. And I'm wondering if her mom is from a place where they have an untreated water supply, mm. because I know when I was a kid, we didn't have a treated water supply and sometimes you'd get cryptosporidium in the water. And uh, the, the, the locals would call it you know, beaver fever. Yes. And uh, you'd, you'd be on boil. You'd have to boil your water for days because mm. otherwise, yeah, you'd spend a number of uncomfortable days on the toilet mm. if you didn't. And the other thing I thought was really interesting was the, um, her precognitive dream about the shuttle landing. Because mm. I think that that so clearly shows that we need to examine our dreams a little bit more carefully because... We only know what we know, but we can also pick up maybe certain signals, which help us, which kind of tell us of things to come, but it has to process it through things we know, mm. which I'm kind of fascinated by. So she saw Texas University or whatever, whichever university it was, because that's what she knew. But of course it was just a subbing in for Texas. Yeah. Precognition is, is a very unappreciated subject these days. It's a fascinating topic once you dive into it and it can terrify you if you dive too much into it. Is there anyone out there that you know of doing research on this, sort of in our field? Um, not as much as they used to be. It used to be very widely investigated up until the 1970s and I think more people, I think it, the, the pool spread so far that people they were getting swamped with people who were just consistently wrong all the time. There was right. too much noise. What I would say is there was a very excellent episode of uh, Unexplained, which is uh, Richard McLean Smith's podcast. Okay. Um, a couple of years ago, and he was talking about the Aberfan disaster in Wales in 1966, which is awful, um, where right. a school was hit by a tidal wave of sludge. Oh, my God. Uh, at quarter past nine in the morning, and it killed 106 children. Jesus Christ. Uh, it was the last day of school, and uh, the coal stack next to it collapsed and just basically hit them in a, in a coal tsunami. Um, oh, my God. But there were stories and pictures that the kids had mentioned before that it had happened, um, like pictures of one kid drew lots of black everywhere and just wrote the end in the corner. He was one of the kids that died. Oh, my um, God. Another child said to her mother one day, just sat there going, I'm not afraid of dying, mum, because I'm going to be with my friends when I die. <gasps> they all died. Jesus Christ. So he did a really interesting episode about th these uh, precognition 
events that had, had led up to it. And obviously they had the, fo- the the pictures that the kid had drawn as well. So they knew right. he'd drawn it because it was there. Holy man. So yeah, if you want to be frightened, I would recommend listening to that episode about Abathan. I fully intend to because, you know, who needs to sleep? <laughs> and thank you so much for sharing with us, Charlene. We're sorry that went to such a dark place, but it, again, interesting experiences. It, it's going to lead to conversation. This one is from Angela. Whitby isn't really like anywhere else, and back in the 1980s, it was a much less busy place than it is now. The seaside town was quieter, murkier, and a bit less polished than the tourist spot that it has become. It still has atmosphere and plenty of ghost stories, but the dark alleyways have better lighting, and some of the more curious shops have long since gone. You could probably devote several episodes to the sheer variety of paranormal stories associated with Whitby, and if you've never visited, I'd urge you to do so. Preferably on a stormy day and around dusk to make the most of the atmosphere. I'm not going to tell you about the lady who apparently drops off from the west cliff, hoop skirts inflating as she floats towards the rocks, or the bottom pinching poltergeist at Bagdale Hall, or even the nauseating hand of glory that resides in the Panet Park Museum. This story is about something that doesn't link to any other Whitby legends, but that did have my immediate family as witnesses. We often used to visit Whitby on a weekend. There would be fish and chips, perhaps a cake and coffee at a lovely spicy smelling delicatessen in the old town. A look around the Whitby bookshop with its impossible spiral staircase and a visit to some of many of the antique shops. My parents' favourite antique shop was near the landmark known as the Whalebones, an archway on the West Cliff near the improbably named Khyber Pass. The building in question is on a corner between Khyber Pass, Cliff Street and Mount Square. It's a solid mid-19th century sandstone building with no cavity walls. I can say this with some certainty as our house was built around the same time and with the same materials. The shop was on two floors, and although the building remains, it's now a dance school rather than home to a mixture of chairs and tables with barley twist legs, stuffed animals and Victorian oddments. One completely unremarkable Sunday afternoon, as I waited for my parents and sister to finish browsing in the shop, I stood near the entrance and notice an equally unremarkable iron peg about the same length as my middle finger jammed into the whitewashed wall about a metre and a half up from the floor. As you might expect, there were other nails and screws and pegs holding up old prints, hunting horns and some creepy taxidermy heads. There was, however, something very odd about this particular peg in that it was slowly and very deliberately moving in and out of the solid wall. I watched with curiosity for a few moments before beckoning the rest of my family over to watch. We stood, we watched, we puzzled. We went outside and looked at the same spot on the wall. Nothing worth noticing there, nothing different, just a big solid stone wall. We went back inside and the peg continued its slow journey in and out of the wall. It's worth noting that with every movement, small grains of sandstone were dropping out of the aperture, so this wasn't an optical illusion. The regularity also suggested, I hesitate to say it, but intent of some kind. Weird as this was, I don't think any of us felt fear, though I don't really recall ever going back there afterwards. Nor have we as a family talked about it. It was probably the oddest thing I've ever witnessed. And though I've had other experiences which were strange, the Whitby incident will take some beating. So, so Paul, is this what is this what pegging is, as you were talking about? <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh. But um, I'm very unsurprised that something strange would happen to somebody in Whitby. How so? Because it's just a, a, a place steeped in supernatural law. Oh, interesting. It's It's got a long history of ghosts and 
one of the most famous Yorkshire legends, which is the Bar Guest, which is our fiery phantom dog. Right. Um, there's a couple of those. There's ghosts, uh, as Angela mentions in her message about the uh, the bottom pinching poltergeist, which is one of my favourite ones. I wonder if you'd know to... if you'd known that known that one. <laughs> well, it's a poltergeist more than the fact that it it likes to pinch bottoms. Um, sure, sure. Primarily, <laughs> primarily, but um, and obviously Whitby is is where Dracula landed in the book. Oh, of um, course, and obviously. I, I visited there recently for the incredibly for the very first time in my life. I've never been to Whitby before this year. Oh, that's where they had the amazing Dracula Museum. Yes, that's certainly one word for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it's 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 a beautiful town, um, and it is it's where it is, and with the you know the the ruins of the Abbey on the hill, it's just stunning. It's just full of wonderful old stories and tales and ghosts and ghoulies around every corner, it seems. Oh, that's really cool. Well, I've certainly never heard of anything like Angela has described, and I think that's that's pretty sweet. Mm. Also, why do they call it Kuiper Pass? It was a place in, in, in India where when, when we took over. Right. Ky- when, 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 you, when you moved in as roommates. Yeah, yeah, when we looked after it for a bit. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, yeah. We just borrowed it. Yeah, it's a very, very notorious and treacherous journey in the Indian subcontinent. So, uh, oh, okay, okay. I'd heard it, the it, name before, but I, I didn't know where it was located. Yeah, so it's it's it it has numerous connotations now, shall we say? I see. <laughs> this story comes from Tyler. Last October, my husband and I bought the home he grew up in and spent two long months doing some serious renovations. Something to know about this house, the foundation and some sections of the house are from the 1500s, which is old even by Danish standards. So needless to say, the house already has a bit of a freaky feel to it because of its age. But before this incident, I have never felt weird or uncomfortable in the house. The incident? When we dug up the flooring to pour new concrete, we found a well. Yeah, like the ring in the middle of what is now the kitchen. It was functioning and still half full of water, so we filled it up with concrete, but yeah, bad vibes. So, the floors upstairs are very old, but absolutely beautiful pine wood planks which creak with every step. Another important point is that this happened in February, at around 9pm, and it was very dark because of our blackout curtains. My son's crib was in our bedroom, and at this point he had been asleep for about two hours. We had friends over to play cards and were having a good time downstairs when I heard the baby monitor go off. My son was screaming bloody murder. Not uncommon, but of course I rushed up there to make sure he was okay. As soon as I got to the landing at the top of the stairs, I could hear the floor creaking in the bedroom. It's an old house, so I didn't pay too much attention, though I did notice it and thought it was weird because I'd never noticed it happening in empty rooms before. I turned the landing light on but it only cast enough light to see about two feet into the bedroom. I went in, picked up my son, and sat down in the rocking chair beside the crib where he settled down almost immediately and fell asleep laying on my shoulder. The whole time I was sitting in that chair, I could hear this shuffling sound. It sounded like someone standing still and intentionally being quiet or trying to hide, but shifting their weight. I listened to that sound for a good five minutes coming from a pitch black corner in the back of the bedroom. I was thoroughly freaking out at this point, but again, could reason my way out of it by telling myself it's just old house stuff. Plus, I had a sleeping child on my lap and couldn't exactly freak out like I normally would have. So then I did something I feel a bit bad about, and I laid my son back down in his crib to sleep. I stood in front of the crib listening for a while, and then turned towards the bedroom door to go back downstairs. As soon as I took my first step to leave, heavy footsteps started running towards me slash the crib from that dark corner of the room. The floor was creaking. I could hear the thudding of the footsteps, and it felt sinister. It felt like blackness was rushing at me. It was so loud and so intentional, if that makes sense. It felt angry, and it wanted me to be scared. I screamed for my husband, grabbed my son, and froze. I don't think my husband has ever moved that quickly. He turned on the lights, and of course, nothing was there. I didn't feel or hear anything anymore and the creaking had completely stopped. I cried for a long time before I could tell my husband what happened, and the friends we had over left after witnessing a bit of my ugly crying. 
That was it. Nothing else happened that night except me and my son sleeping in the guest room. I wonder if my son woke up because he could sense there was something in the room. Who knows? I will say, while I was sitting in that chair listening to the shuffling sound, I was thinking of anything and everything I could to explain it away. I left the front door unlocked for 10 minutes while I picked up my son from daycare. Did someone sneak in and hide during that time? We live in a farm town with very few neighbors, and people often leave their doors unlocked. But I had been in my bedroom throughout the afternoon before putting him down to bed, and there aren't many places to hide, especially for someone or something as large as whatever it was that ran at me. I just can't make sense of it. Since then, when I'm alone in the bedroom, I often hear the floor softly creaking. I do not feel threatened or scared at all, but I definitely notice it more than I used to. Maybe it had been happening since we moved in and I just wasn't paying attention to it. My husband is very skeptical and says nothing happens to him slash around him, but he's probably not paying attention or looking out for it either. According to my husband, all of his siblings and his father, nothing similar has happened in the 30 plus years before we moved in, which makes me think that our renovations of the house might have stirred something up or made something mad. Did something come out of the well? I really hope nothing like this happens again, and I can continue to observe horror in movies instead of living it. And yeah, uh, Tyler, I, I, oh man, I hope that happens too, because that I think is one of the scariest stories we've read on the show recently. I'm interested that there seems to be this connection with filling the well in. So why would it necessarily be something that's come out of the well rather than something that can't get back into the well? Oh, shit. That never even occurred to me. Fascinating. So you think that could have something to do with it? Well, if it's stuck, it can't go back, can it? So right. maybe that's why it's lurking around the corners in the unseen areas, just out of the corner of your eye. Oh, that's an unsettling thought. Well, thank you. <laughs> I don't know what I would do. Would I, I don't know if I'd fill the well in or not. I, it's hard to say. It's an odd thing. I mean, they still do turn up here. As well, occasionally you'll find places where they do renovations and, and a lot of places they've just boarded over them and left them and then Weird. somebody comes to do a renovation. So clearly I, I'm making a connection with the renovation and then the incident seemed to occur from that renovation, which is a tried and tested standard in regards to encouraging or, or suffering from increased paranormal activity through a renovation. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what's what's fascinating to me then, though, is that means that there's been something there this whole time, mm. but the husband's family just didn't catch it, which I guess makes sense. If if they're not that way inclined, then they're not going to pick up on it. Yeah, yeah. Or it may be that there was nobody that young in the house either before. Was her husband and his family, were any of those small children when they moved in? I mean, it could be one, either of all of those things. I mean, she said he grew up there, so that would sort of indicate to me that, you know, he was young when he moved in. But again, if they're, if they're just not sensitive, I mean, if, if sensitivity runs in the family, I have to imagine insensitivity, at mm -hmm. least as far as, you know, spirituality goes, I, I have to wonder if that runs in families as well. So maybe just, yeah. you've had a bunch of people living there who just didn't notice these things. And this thing kind of came and went. And, you know, again, it's like, it's like having a roommate who you never see. Yeah. 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 And it's, you know, old house. Oh, it's just the floorboard settling. It's just the timber settling. Sure. It's nothing, it's nothing walking about. Oh. <laughs> when I lived in a house, I always constantly would wake up because I was certain I heard someone walking around downstairs. <laughs> and I would do that very Italian thing of standing at the top of the stairs with my baseball bat going, who's down there? Because, <laughs> you know, the burglar is going to go, nobody but us chickens. And, and then I'll go, aha, I got you. Well, it's not like you've got a big cellar under your house, is it? Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> with a door that says keep out written on it <laughs> oh good also said beware of the dog so I don't know what was going on in there <laughs> dead inside well this would be fine I'm sure <laughs> red brum <laughs> well, well that doesn't make any sense <laughs> just rub it out with the bottom with your sleeve I'm sure this yeah. will not be important later yeah but it, I think it's really nice that we finally had a story where it's been a while since we've had a very skeptical husband. That's true. Yeah. We, on Ghost Story Guys Bingo, we can, we can check off skeptical husband for today. Sweet. <laughs> so thank you again, Tyler. And again, I, yeah, I really hope that you don't have any of that shit happening again or that whatever it is, is reached a kind of equilibrium with you guys. And 
either way, it, it, it stops pulling that kind of nonsense because that is terrifying. Our final story is from Wanda. When I was about 15 years old, I was going through a great many changes in my life. At that time, conflict and stress were an overwhelming reality for me. Over about a six month period, I had my first encounter with a hat man, a phenomena that was not well known at the time, moving objects which I could not explain, and a little girl who just quietly stood looking at me from the end of my bed. The little girl did not scare me, I just knew that she should not be there. To this day I will never forget her appearance. She looked to be about eight years old, and had light brown hair that was worked into two braids which hung over each shoulder. I can even remember the details of what she was wearing. She had on a white shirt and a red and black kilt. I recall sitting up in bed and looking at her, and all I could think about was how odd it was that her orange socks did not match her plaid skirt. As I said, I was not afraid of her, nor do I believe she was of me. She just appeared to be very sad, and she continued to visit me almost nightly for a time. I mustered enough courage to talk about these encounters with one of my more open-minded girlfriends, and she in turn talked to her equally open-minded mum. Soon after, my girlfriend brought me a very disturbing message from her mum. My friend told me her mum thought it could be one of two things happening. I was either having a nervous breakdown, which I have to say was really comforting to hear, or it was a ghost. She also told me an entity would never try to communicate unless you speak to it first. Her mum also said that she believed it was very important for me to try and talk to the little girl, and that this was to be done as soon as possible, because she may be a lost soul in search of help. I was shocked. I wasn't expecting anyone to believe me, let alone send a message like this. I didn't know if I had it in me to talk to someone or something that may or may not be there. So I waited for the little girl's return, and I didn't have long to wait. In a few days, I was again awakened by the form of the little girl standing at the end of my bed. Just as before, her quiet but sad appearance did not frighten me. Remembering the advice, I slowly sat up in my bed and pulled together enough courage to ask why she was visiting me and if she needed help. She just continued to sorrowfully look at me, but said nothing. I told her I didn't like to see her so unhappy, and I thought it best that she go home and assured her that she may be happier there. I waited a few minutes, allowing her time to perhaps respond but there was nothing but silence. Not knowing what else to do, I quietly said goodnight, lay back down, and then drifted back to sleep. That was the last time I saw the little girl in the plaid skirt. In my heart, I hope she went home, or somehow was able to find peace. And Wanda, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, and I, I'm sure Wanda doesn't mind me saying that is uh, Wanda Fraser. She's a friend of the show, a very, very talented artist who you can find, uh, actually she has her own ghost story website at thehauntingofus.com. Uh, she's also got some really, really great artwork there as well. So make sure to check that out. Interesting that she, that's the final time she turned up. Like mm. even though she seemed not to understand the message, she clearly got the point. Yep. Yeah. I think it's very interesting that we ha also had a very strange proposition that you're either going mad or it's a ghost. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure I like either of those options, if I'm honest. Uh, I don't I think I'd, if I'm going to go anywhere, I think I'll fall for the supernatural explanation. Thank you. That's it. Also, not just, not a red shirt, a red skirt, a red plate yeah. skirt. Yeah. Yeah. I, again, I don't know, you know, we've kind of come up with different explanations for why people see plaid or, or check in these cases. And, and uh, this doesn't fit any of the things we've talked about. Hmm. So, no, that's a mystery, but uh, if you've got your own encounter with the uh, the plaid people, the flannel man, whatever you want to call it, let us know. Ghoststoryguys at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear your paranormal stories. We read everything that you send in, although I am shit at email, so I do not get back to everyone, and for that I apologize. I want to thank everyone who's written in on this show and uh, everyone who's written in otherwise and whose stories we have just have not been able to work in yet. We love hearing from you, and you can reach us at 
ghoststoryguys at gmail.com. All right, we're going to take a quick break and be right back with our much, much anticipated Ghost Force shoutouts. Hey there, listeners. Before you reach for that skip 15 seconds ahead button, I promise you this isn't an ad. We wanted to take a minute to talk to you about mental health. On this show, I've always tried to be as honest and open as possible about my struggles with depression and anxiety, because even though we've come a long way towards acknowledging the very real damage these things can do, there is still way too much lingering stigma about reaching out for help. And when you start to feel like there's no help, it's easy to start feeling like there's no hope. But Paul has joined me today to remind you there is always hope and there's always help. We're not going to try and talk you out of self-harming right now because we know that's not how it works. Instead, what we wanted to do was tell you something now and hope that should things get bad, you'll remember it and make a phone call or send a text message before you make any permanent decisions. As someone who knows all too well just how important mental health can be. It's never too late to reach out. In Canada, the number to call is 133-456-4566. In the USA, the number to call is 1-800-273-8255. In the UK, the number to call is 116-123 or text SHOUT, that's S-H-O-U-T, to 85258. In Australia, the number to call is 131114. However bad shit seems, it will pass. And no matter what your brain might be telling you at any given moment, and believe me when I say I know this intimately, there are people who love you and people who care deeply about how you treat yourself. Should a time come when you find yourself despairing, Please know that we've both been where you are, and there is a way back to the world. Take care. Welcome back. Thanks as always to Luke, Anthony, and Sarah, and everyone else in the Ghost Story Guys family. Don't forget to check out Luke's podcast, Luke Lore, which is back in action and available on podcast platforms everywhere. Thanks, of course, too, to my friend and co-host, the paranormal Johnny Carson himself, Paul Bestel, host of the Mysteries and Monsters podcast. What's coming up on Eminem, Paul? Right, well, it's October, so obviously this month we'll be seeing some rather spooky subjects covered. As this episode lands, I will have released my uh, in-depth discussion into cattle mutilations around the States with Christopher O'Brien. We've got phantom black dogs coming up, we've got ghost stories, strange creatures in the woods, and uh, a couple of other surprising episodes. One which may be... um, Rather warming in the yes. subject matter, <laughs> shall we say. I'm looking forward to that one. Mm. And where can everyone find you on social media? Uh, you can find us across all social media platforms looking for Mysteries and Monsters. Uh, the website is mysteriesandmonsters.com. And you can find us on all good podcast sharing platforms under Mysteries and Monsters as well. Lovely. You can find me on social media. I'm at Larger the Truth on Twitter and Instagram. And you can find my other show, Larger the Truth with Brennan Store. That's. Uh, non-paranormal interview podcast and that is at uh, well you can find that everywhere find podcast live also you can pick up the audiobook version of my book a strange little place the hauntings and unexplained events of one small town on amazon and audible all right so we promised you patron information and patron information you shall receive if you want to sign up you head on over to patreon.com slash ghost story guys we have tiers at the one five ten twenty and fifty dollar levels and you get access to a massive archive of recorded material. There's the weekly Book of the Dead shows, the weekly Host Adventures shows, 
There's uh, me and Paul, which is usually a monthly or bi-monthly show where Paul and I talk about whatever the hell's going on for sometimes up to two hours. It gets kind of ridiculous sometimes. <laughs> uh, actually, there's going to be like a, just from this episode, about 25 minutes worth of stuff where we bitch about uh, The Hobbit and uh, <laughs> James Bond movies. So, you know, if that sounds enthralling to you, they definitely want to go check that out. Yeah. Our guide to how to upset middle-aged men. Yeah, it's true. It's uh, guaranteed, in fact. Foolproof method. So you can find that there. And there's so much more. There's physical rewards. There's live, live streams. Just a ton of cool stuff over at patreon.com slash ghost story guys. And of course, if you are a member at the $20 level and above, every second episode, you get thanked as a member of Ghost Force. <laughs> That's right. Every second episode, members of Ghost Force are thanked here in this section, in this voice, because, well, at this point, I've damaged it so much, I may as well just keep going. And it reminds me of when I used to be a smoker. That too. Good times. Crazy times, but good times. Well, yes. (laughs) You ever see Paul in person? Ask him about the graveyard story. (laughs) (laughs) This time around, the members of Ghost Force are... Atham Saragon. Amanda Jenks. Amanda Strong. Ashley Marsha. Cheryl Baker. Christopher Coons. Danielle Harris. Eric Abel. Hannah Brown. Hannah Siemens. Jackie McFarland. Jeanette Patterson. Jean Cupertino. Joseph Como. Julia <laughs> Lugubrious. Just Julie. Jenna Blackwelder. Ian Harrison. Karen. Kimberly Hansen. Lauren Michaud. Lumpy Rug. Mara Noriega. Mark Simler. Mary Rose WW. Peter Guns 08.5. Rebecca Brink. Rhonda Sheen. Richard Easby. You are the few. You are the spooky. You are Ghost Force. Thank you so much. You guys are crazy and I love you for it. We both do. We appreciate the support like crazy. And uh, yeah. Thank you. And if you want to be thanked in that bizarre segment, which I've come to love very dearly, <laughs> go to patreon.com slash ghost story guys. Yes. I'm not sure my throat does, but yes, I agree. <laughs> yeah. yeah I mean, the, the grand sacrifice. No, I'm not, I'm not going to pursue that any further. <laughs> yes. It's a good job. I like to put on funny voices. Yeah, exactly. Well, it always reminds me of that, that uh, email I once got when I first started Mysteries and Monsters from someone saying, I really like your show, but I'm not sure why you're putting on a fake British accent. Well, I do wonder that sometimes. Because hmm. apparently nobody in Britain speaks like this. Well, no, your voice is really like this. <laughs> yes, it is. Hi, I'm Paul Bestel. Yes, Paul Bestel from Sheffield. That's right. This is Mysteries and Monsters, and we're going to talk about <laughs> some wild bullshit. <laughs> yes, it's Sasquatch Central. <laughs> it's a bevy of Bigfoots this week on Mysteries and Monsters. Now it's got that transatlantic thing you sound like an old-timey newsman. <laughs> this week on Mysteries and Monsters, it's a bevy of Bigfoots. Strange things in the woods. A slew of Sasquatch. <laughs> Mrs. Johnson has been frightened in her cowshed. Scandal. Who's been <laughs> shacking up with Mothman? <laughs> Later, Dogman. What's he really like? A little, little ghost force there. Anyways, moving on. <laughs> Pampered pooch or grumpy canine. <laughs> That's right. Has Dogman gone Hollywood? <laughs> this researcher who never leaves his trailer says yes. <laughs> uh, always reminds me. I remember once watching a. I think it might have been mysteries and, and monsters. Strangely enough, mysteries and monsters, monsters and mysteries in America. Right. Um, no connection. And uh, they once interviewed these two guys from some place in States who were going to hunt monsters. And it was clearly two guys who just drunk up too much energy drink. <laughs> Let's go, Kyle. Oh. <laughs> Let's go. We've been playing Dungeons and Dragons for seven years, so we can deal with any shit in the woods. <laughs> Bear has entered the chat. <laughs> ah! I can't <laughs> run very well. <laughs> <laughs> If you want to get in touch, send us an email at ghoststoryguys at gmail.com. You can also get a hold of us on, uh, we're on Twitter as Ghost Story Guys. We are on Facebook as Ghost Story Guys. And we are on Instagram as the Ghost Story Guys. 
If you want to send us a story, email is the best way to do it. You, if you DM it, odds are I'm going to lose it. That's just me. Uh, it's again, it's not personal. I'm just bad at organization sometimes. So yeah, if you want to send us a story, ghoststoryguys at gmail.com or you can call the ghost line. There's something strange in your neighborhood. We're gonna call ghost line. Call one triple eight five eight eight six nine two zero. Thank you to our listener Amber Pees for her ghost line jingle. Again, the number is one triple eight five eight eight six nine two zero. You can leave your story or comment for the show as one or a series of voicemails, and we'll do our best to play those on the show itself. We actually had someone uh, text the ghost line recently asking if it was still active. Yes, it is. And they wanted to know if they could send pictures. Yes, they can. <laughs> and the text number is 925-553-4789. In terms of news, I don't think I've got, again, I, I recorded a spot on Mission Spooky, but that's not going to be out till the end of the month. And I don't think there's anything else noteworthy coming up. Uh, nothing really booked for Halloween, nothing particularly unusual or noteworthy. How about you? Um, I am appearing on a show called Over the Rainbow with Bob Brown um, at some point in October, and I've got another interview coming up that should be out before the end of October. Uh, and that's it so far in between trying to release 216 episodes in October. You are a busy man, Paul Best. <laughs> Yes, uh, and disclaimer, it probably won't be more than seven, but I just thought I'd mention that. I don't think there needs to be any more than seven. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Fuck me. Um, I forgot what I was going to say now. Podcasting machine over there distracted me. <laughs> Podcast bot <bought> 12,000. <000. laughs> Brown's like, oh man, I put out a bi-weekly show and a weekly show and I, that's my full-time job. I'm tired. Paul's like, I put out 47 fucking podcasts and I work full time. <laughs> yeah, well, I did, I did cook, uh, you know, cook full, beautiful meal before tonight as well. So, I, you know, I do cook five times a week too. Get out. <laughs> I have no son. <laughs> yes. I'm started, I'm stealing neighbor's dogs to take them for long walks. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've not got enough things to do. Sneaking into the rooms of the elderly at night to read to them. Why Whether not? they want it or not. Yes. Yes. You'll be amazed how many old people I'm heard about Bigfoot. <laughs> oh, I was like Lady Chatterley's lover or something, but yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. Old people don't like to hear about spontaneous human combustion. Who'd have thought it? Bunch of killjoys. We'll see who's laughing on the other side of their face when they catch fire. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who are they going to come running to to put them out then? That's right. This this took a turn. <laughs> yeah. Well, my phone's off, Grandma. <laughs> Paul has left the chat. <laughs> oh God. Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> All right. So that's it for news. Uh, <laughs> Oh, yeah, don't forget to check us out in Paranormality Magazine. You can find that on our social media. Um, it's in the Instagram bio or uh, by going to Paranormality, it's paranormalitymagazine.com. Mm. There's a lovely interview there with uh, with Michaela. And it was a ton of fun. We had a great time talking to those guys, and, or talking to her, rather. And she even managed to pick up some of our nerdy bullshit about comics. So that was pretty great. Thanks again to those guys for putting us in there. And uh, we were on a cover yeah. with, with the great Sam Sheeran, which is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the great and the good in that episode, it's like uh, my favorite people in the world of the uh, the weird. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's it. we we were so lucky to be in that one. It was fantastic. If you want to pick up some Ghost Story Guys merch, head on over to our website at ghoststoryguys.com. You can find the links to our T Public, Red Bubble, and Big Cartel stores. And from there, yeah, you can find links to anything: t-shirts, mugs, pins, all that good stuff. And if you do buy something, if you want to send us a picture of you wearing the gear, we'll put it up on our social media. And we certainly appreciate it. I know our listener, Julie, just got in touch. She bought a couple new shirts. So thank you very much, Julie. We very much appreciate it. If you could leave the show a five-star review anywhere you can, helps bump the numbers, get a few more eyes on the show, and uh, well, it makes us feel good. So we, we very much appreciate that. Big thanks again to our musical guest, Vampire Stepdad, and his song Montrose from his brand new album, Sanguine. You can find that at VampireStepdad.com or stream it everywhere you stream your music. But if you can, pick up a copy. It, uh, 
Again, vote with your dollars, help support independent artists. They really, really appreciate it. And with VSD, you're just supporting a great guy. So again, thanks to Vampire Stepdad, and look forward to next episode when we share another track from Sanguine. Speaking of music, our theme song, Radio Into the Darkness We Go, is composed and performed by Peter of Bizanta Music. You can find more from him at nightharvestrecordings.com or wherever you stream your tunes. Our story's theme is The Future Belongs to Them Now by Hexagram. You can find more from them by searching for Hexagram wherever you get your music. And that's Hexagram with two X's, not three. And I guess that's going to do it. Yeah. So we'll be back in a couple of weeks with some more spooky stories. But until then, into the darkness we go. You know you're in trouble when you can see the rats leaving. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Where are you going? I'm not living in this shit hole. <laughs> yes, right. Good They're luck, buddy. The greyhound. <laughs> <laughs> little, little knapsacks. Hey, who's ready? This guy. <laughs> who's got two thumbs and is on top of this? <laughs> I think you're going to appreciate my story that I, that I have for the opener. I'm looking forward to it. It's very spooky. <laughs> Ooh. Well, we scared someone. We'll put it that way. Mm. I guess not scare them. We ruined their day. Well, we ruined someone's day. I'll explain. <laughs> okay, I got it. Where the fuck is the script? Where the fuck is the script? Oh, man. Yesterday, we uh, paid uh, 25 bucks to buy Free Guy. Yeah. And, uh, so, and it was fun. It was a lot of fun. You know, something that oh, I'll probably watch it again. Mm. Well, today they announced it's dropping on fucking Disney Plus in Canada. Yeah, it's Disney Plus here as well for free. $25. <laughs> good, but it's not that good if I was, could have gotten it for free. <laughs> Jesus, Horatio Christ. When I do my investigations, I've got to be skeptical. Well, I haven't seen any skepticism at all. I've just seen absolute pandemonium. Oh, I tell you what, it, make, it makes that look like Monster Quest. Wow. Okay. Even I was amazed. I don't know why I've lasted three episodes, to be honest. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> Look at the time. I'm gonna go, gonna go drown myself in the toilet. <laughs> That's where you go when you've learned things you wish you rather hadn't. Yes. Is it me or you at this point? It's me now. <laughs> okay. Glad one of us. I seemed like so long ago. Yeah. Well, if she starts. She starts talking about that time her husband came back from the dead. <laughs> then you know we'll know something's up. <laughs> I used to think I had two children. <laughs> yeah. And they were able to use Project Tahiti to bring back Coulson, but not my brother. What the fuck is that about? 